what has happened really is from the 1500 right up to 1776, you have 276 years, almost 300 years. Now, during this period, Europeans have settled in the Americas from Canada all the way up to Argentina, and they have gradually ex uh, 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 transplanted many of the institutions that they knew back home in Europe. Now, where the Muslims will find themselves increasingly in a different situation, both in terms of defining who you are as a person, who you are as a society, who you are as a state, would become evident since 1776. Because since 1776 to now, what has happened is the Europeans have gone through major transformation. One is that the idea of kingship, which still enjoys some legitimacy and importance among the Muslims, was destroyed by the American Revolution. Because the Americans revolted against British rule, not only colonialism, but they were also opposed to monarchy. Now, Americans are not the first Republicans. We know that historically, you have republics in Greece and in Rome, but they never last long. You see what I'm saying? Now, Americans have survived over 200 years. If you go back and you look at uh, the history of republics in the Roman and Greek period. Now, what is very interesting is that with the coming of the American Revolution, you have a new day in terms of European thought and European understanding of power. The divine rights of king was challenged in Europe. And gradually, you will see the abolition of all those concepts about kingship in the French Revolution. The French Revolution was a major turning point in terms of the evolution of the Europeans. And if you are talking about Muslims and the West, you have to take that into account in terms of the different trage uh, uh, trajectories. I told you that some scholars have used the metaphor of the, uh, the, the fraternal twins, meaning Islam, the Muslims, and the Christians are like fraternal twins. But because of the last two, three, four hundred years ago, years, you have seen this parting of the ways in terms of understanding the concept of the person or the individual, the concept of society, and the concept of the state. In the United States, they challenged the idea of kingship, but they did not. <coughs> they did not challenge the authority of the churches. You see, in France, the French were fighting two monsters. They were fighting the king, they were fighting the church. And that's one of the reasons why the Americans have evolved differently from the French. In America, there is no established church as in England. They didn't have to challenge because there was no established church. So you have this separation of church and state. In England, the head of state is the Queen of England. In England, the head of the church is the Queen of England, just like Henry VIII. The only difference is, in England, since the Magna Carta, we have seen the gradual erosion of power of the king. The Cromwell Revolution, to the point that the parliament became the center of power, not the king or the queen. The queen of England reigns, she doesn't rule. You see what I'm saying? She reigns, she doesn't rule. Now, the American Revolution created a situation whereby the president became an executive power, but he is not a king. Although Hamilton wanted Washington to be the first king, George. Now, the reality is the French Revolution changed the situation in France. The, the Catholic Church was overthrown by the French Revolution. The king was sent to the guillotine. So you have a different situation in France. Now, these are very important transformation, mental and psychological and political transformation in Europe. In the sense that the American Revolution created a republic whereby you don't have a king but a president, 
who is not a king, and he is subject to periodic re-election. And of course, Washington set the precedent of two terms until, until FDR broke that. And then Republicans get nervous, they pass an amendment to block that. So you can't have two terms. So what was just a precedent and not part of the Constitution would now be elevated to an important part of the Constitution through an amendment. Now, the Russian Revolution would also have a radical transformation because of their adoption of Marxism. They were fighting three monsters at the same time. They were fighting a king, they were fighting the church, and they were fighting the ruling property owners. Something that was not talked about in the American Revolution. In fact, in the American Revolution, what did they say in the Declaration of Independence? Life, original draft, if you are a Jeffersonian scholar, it was property. You just scratch it out. In the editing process, they scratch out property. And they put pursuit of happiness, which is much more wider concept. <laughs> you see, so in the Russian Revolution, they were fighting the king. So they wiped out the Romanov. They were fighting the church. They wiped them out. And they also wiped out the Kulaks and all those property groups. Now, this did not happen in the Islamic experience. And you still have tension going on in the Muslim world in Saudi Arabia and in Kuwait. The Arab nationalists, the Arab republicans, try to create republican states in Egypt, right? And they overthrow whom? King Farouk. <laughs> but there is no church to be overthrown. So Nasser could not. But in Turkey, what happened? They abolished the caliphate, right? And Ataturk gave them a new script to the point that the Turks don't have Arabic as the orthography of their language, which used to be the case. So he virtually gave them a pill of amnesia. So they forget everything about their past in terms of the alphabetization of their language. Now, the Russian Revolution therefore changed the situation. This is something that has happened over the last 500 years. And these last 500 years changed the way Western people see themselves in terms of defining who they are, what they are. And this would change the relationship fundamentally within the West itself. Because as a result of the French Revolution, primarily the French Revolution more than the American Revolution, the Jews became equal citizens of the Christians. That was never the case in Europe. It was Napoleon who changed the day. Because he was the one who said after the French Revolution that a Jew is a citizen and he deserves the right to be a citizen as a person. But we are not going to recognize them as a group. The same problem we now have with the Muslims in France. And that's one reason why you have the hijab problem in France. Because the French came up with the concept of laïcité. Laïcité is the dominant concept. The Algerians, <laughs> we have a sister here who came out of Algeria, can relate to that. Because the French decided that you, the French person, are a citizen of France. And your primary loyalty is to the state of France, the nation of France. And they are very particular about their language, to the point that they have a high priest. They call them the immortals, who monitor the content of the language. We don't have that in even the Arabs. They love their language, but they don't have any academy Arabic. There is Damascus. They tried to create one. 
you see what I'm saying? But you have the academic Francais. That monitors. When I tell my students the difference between the Western people as, as they have evolved over the last 500 years and the differences among the Western people as a result of that, because that will help you understand the relationship with the Muslim world, is that if you use the workman metaphor to understand the differences in terms of political culture of the Americans, the British, the French, and the Russian under communism, you have to tell your students, they all have workmen, most of them anyway, that the American political culture based on the Constitution is telling you, the one who wears the workman, because you are an individual, you are a citizen, you are very much absorbed with yourself, you can listen to your music from your workman, and you can dance. But for heaven's sake, don't step on the psychological toes of your neighbors. That's the separation of church and state concept among the Americans. If you want to explain to them the British, where you have the king or the queen as the head of state and the head of the church, you can listen to your workman and you can dance, whether you are Jew, Buddhist, Muslim, Hindu, whatever, in London. But if you are so excited in dancing, don't expect to dance with the queen. Because she selects whosoever she wishes to dance, and she already has predetermined partners, those who are members of the Anglican Church. If you go to France, you wear your workman, and you can listen to any music you want, but be rest assured that the French state exercise the same right that the airline pilot exercises when he can break through the speakerphone and address you anytime he wants. <laughs> And that's what the Muslims are learning right now in France. <laughs> and the Jews are learning. And the Christians who like to wear a big cross are learning. That you have freedom of religion, but we determine how big the size of your cross, how white the kippah you're wearing as a Jew, or how you cover your head with your hijab. See, you don't have that problem in England. You don't have that problem in... In fact, the British government came out very strongly and said, we don't have that problem. <laughs> And in America, the Supreme Court, if you want to attack a Muslim who is in hijab, the Supreme Court justices are just going to knock you out. They will rule against it. They, I mean, even the Bush administration went on behalf of the hijabis in this country. It's part of the American law already. They did it. They say, we are going to support the hijabis in America. Now, in France, of course, it's a different ballgame. Now, if you go to Russia and you look at the Russian situation, the Russian analogy, you can say, you wear your... Workman, you hear music, you can dance, but we think you are crazy. <laughs> we have to put you in a mental asylum. <laughs> because you believe in religion. And we think that people who believe in religion must be lunatics. They're crazy. You see, so you have these different things that have developed in the West. And it changes the whole history of identity among Westerners. And the rest of the world, including the Muslims, are being forced by modernity to negotiate which of these approaches or more. What is very interesting is that the Iranian revolution has brought us back to the old debate that started in Europe by reintroducing state control over religion. That's what the Iranian revolution is. That's why we have these five models, the British model, Today, everywhere, if you go in the world, they have perfect or imperfect imitation of these five models. The American model, the British model, the French model, the Iranian model, and the Soviet communist model. These are the only five models in terms of church and state, and it defines the nature of citizenship. So if you are going to look at Muslims and Christians in the world, 
you have to look at it in terms of the way the world has evolved over the last 500 years. Otherwise, you really make some very wrong statements, as if you have all the Westerners on this side and you have all the Muslims on the other side. Because then you, your analysis is very weak. Because if you look at the Muslim world, you don't have a monolithic Muslim world. You have different countries. They have different ways of responding to modernity with regard to the citizenship of persons, the state relationships, and the nature of the society. Am I clear? Thank you very much.